Let's investigate the no cloning theorem. Consider the states psi 1, psi 2, and chi. These three states are elements of the Hilbert space denoted by fancy h. Psi 1, psi 2, and chi are labels for these kets in Dirac notation. So these three labels tell us which state we're dealing with. And all of these states belong to this Hilbert space. Also consider a unitary operator, u, which acts on the Hilbert space, h, tensor product, h. So we can think of this as the Hilbert space for a subsystem and the Hilbert space for another subsystem. And we use this tensor product to describe a larger Hilbert space, which describes the total system. And this unitary operator acts on this Hilbert space. This h is exactly the same h we're dealing with over here. And these three states are elements of that Hilbert space. So let's suppose that it is possible to clone a quantum state. What does that mean in terms of an equation? Let's use this unitary operator to write down an equation that tells us what cloning means. So consider u. u is going to act on the state psi j chi. Now let me unpack this notation. First of all, this j is a placeholder for 1 or 2. So I'm going to use j over here as a placeholder so that we can write two equations in one equation. So uh, whatever I write for psi j is valid for both psi 1 and psi 2. And this chi over here is the same chi that we're dealing with here. So these are Greek letters, psi and chi. And implicitly, we have a tensor product between these two kets. So you can write this as this ket tensor product with this ket. And the tensor product is denoted by this symbol. So we can put that symbol in between here. And implicitly, that symbol is there. But we don't need to write it because it is clear from the context. And also, I'm putting brackets around here to make it very clear that this u is acting on this state. So the state formed through these states. It's not acting on just this psi j. So if these brackets were not here, you could misinterpret this equation as u acting on this psi j. But u acts on this Hilbert space. It acts on h tensor product h. So u is going to act on both of these states, or on the state that is constructed by the tensor product of psi j and chi. So this is going to be equal to a global phase factor, which I'll call phi sub j, uh, multiplied by the state psi j psi j. So let's analyze what is going on over here. So this global phase factor does not have physical significance. We can't measure the global phase factor in an experiment. But it is a consequence in general of a unitary operator. So this phi sub j could depend on psi j and chi. So the states that we input over here uh, could impact what global phase factor gets produced. And uh, this is not actually that important because there is no physical significance. But we put that in there just for completeness. So that we're, we're writing a general mathematical equation. The most important par part about this equation is the action of the unitary. What does the unitary operator do? It copies psi j and it replaces chi. So chi disappears and then we're ending up with two copies of psi j. So that is what cloning means. That is what it means to clone a quantum state. We're taking the information that uh, describes psi j and we're copying it over onto this subspace of the system. And we're erasing the information that describes chi. So this disappears over here. Once this unitary operator acts on these states, we no longer have the information that describes the state chi and we're just left with two copies in this tensor product. So again, there is implicitly a tensor product symbol in between these two kets. The next step that we're going to do is find the bra version of this equation. And I'll write the bra version underneath. 
So the bra version of this equation is going to uh, be formed by taking the Hermitian adjoint. So first, let's take the Hermitian adjoint of u, which is denoted by u dagger. And then we're going to take the bra version of this state. And the bra version of the state is psi j chi, both in bra form. And can you see that if I don't write these brackets, you could misinterpret this as u dagger just acting on chi. But u dagger doesn't just act on chi. It doesn't act on this Hilbert space. It doesn't act on h by itself. It acts on h tensor product h. So to make that clear, we'll put some brackets around here. So u dagger is acting on these guys collectively, on the tensor product of these states. And notice that the order is important. The order is still the same. Psi j is on the left and chi is on the right. The order is used to determine which subspace we're dealing with. So if we don't want to use the order to determine which subspace we're dealing with, we would have to add some indices. We could call this uh, subspace subspace A, and we could call this subspace B. And then we would put a little A over here, a little B over here, A and B. And we could also do the same thing. We would put this A and B. But that is redundant because the order gives us sufficient information to conclude which subspace we're dealing with. So this subspace on the left is the same subspace over here. So this is uh, a very general principle in quantum mechanics. If you want to combine Hilbert spaces together, you can take the tensor product, and that allows you to describe subspaces together as a collective total system. So you can think of this as one subspace and another subspace being smooshed together to describe the collective system. So we're describing the behavior of the system as a whole. So this is the left-hand side of this equation. Now let's see what happens to the right-hand side of the equation. This needs to be complex conjugated, so we're going to have e to the minus i phi j. And note that this phi j depends on what these states are. So this can depend on psi j and chi. And then we're going to need to take the bra version over here. So we're going to have psi j and another psi j. So in the bra version, we are also doing the same thing. This unitary operator, u dagger, is acting uh, from the right, and it is changing these bras. It's erasing this chi. Chi does not appear on, on the right-hand side. And it is copying the information about psi j onto that subspace. So this subspace on the right, uh, it is getting uh, this information copied into it. So that is what cloning does. Now, because the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side, we can take this left-hand side and act from the left over here. And we can take this right-hand side and act from the left over here. So let's do that underneath. That's going to give us the following equation. We're going to have this psi. And another thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to put psi 1 uh, for this equation and psi 2 for this equation. Because it works in general for any uh, psi j. So it's going to work for psi 1 and it's going to work for psi 2. So I'll put psi 1 over here, then chi, and then I'm going to have u dagger. And that's going to be followed by, I'll write this in black, we're going to have u, and then we're going to have the state psi 2 chi. And what is this going to be equal to? Well, we're going to have on the left, I'll put this in brackets, e to the minus i phi 1. We're putting 1 because we have a 1 over here. And then we're going to have psi 1, psi 1. And I'll close the brackets. And then we're going to have this portion of the equation, the ket part of the equation, which is e to the i phi 2. That's because we have a 2 over here. And then we're going to have psi 2, psi 2. And I'll close the brackets. So you can see that this blue portion of the equation is equal to this blue portion of the equation. And this black portion of the equation is equal to this black portion of the equation. Notice that the signs of the global phase factors are opposite. That's because we have to take the complex conjugate over here, because we have the bra version of the equation. And everywhere where we have the blue, we're dealing with the index 1. And everywhere where it's black, we're dealing with the index 2. And in both of these cases, we're losing this information about chi 
in the subspace that's on the right, and we're copying the information on the subspace that's on the left onto that subspace on the right. So Psi1 gets copied onto the right, and Psi2 also gets copied onto the right. Now, let's identify uh, this U dagger U as the identity operator. So this is the identity. That is the definition of unitary operators. If you take U and U dagger in either order, that is going to give you the identity. So because this is the identity, we can ignore that. It has no effect. And then we can just take the inner product of these terms. So when we take the inner product of these states that are constructed by the tensor product, we have to take the inner product within the corresponding subspaces. So that means this left subspace is going to interact with this left subspace, and this right subspace is going to interact with this right subspace. So that's going to give us the following relationship. We're going to get psi1 inner product with psi2, and over here we're going to get chi1 inner product with chi2. So that's in the right subspace, that's this inner product, and this is in the left subspace. And I'll put a little dot over here because these are complex numbers that we get uh, from the result of an inner product, and they are just values. So we're multiplying values together. And this unitary operator has disappeared because it's turned into the identity. We have u dagger u. And now let's have a look at the right-hand side of the equation. Uh, this global phase factor can be factored out over here, so that's going to give us e to the minus i phi 1 minus phi 2. So the phase factor we get is the difference between these individual phase factors. And phi 1 depends on what psi 1 and chi are, and phi 2, that depends on what psi 2 and chi are. So this uh, phase factor out the front is not going to have any physical significance, but I'm putting that in there just for generality. And now let's evaluate the inner product over here. First, we look at the left subspace. That's going to give us psi 1 inner product with psi 2. And then we're going to multiply that by this right subspace inner product, which is psi 1, psi 2 in an inner product. And you can see that's the same value. So here we have this complex number, which is the result of evaluating an inner product, and it's appearing twice. Let's take the absolute value of both sides of this equation. We can notice that here we have chi inner product with itself. And because these states are normalized, they are normalized state vectors in this Hilbert space, uh, this inner product evaluates to 1. So the inner product of a normalized state with itself is equal to 1. So this uh, disappears because it is just multiplying by the multiplicative identity. So that just leaves this inner product is equal to some global phase factor times the inner product squared. So we can get rid of that uh, phase factor by taking the absolute value of both sides of the equation. So that gives us the absolute value of the inner product of psi with uh, psi 1 with psi 2 is equal to the absolute value of the inner product of psi 1 with psi 2 squared. So this square over here is present and then when we take the inner uh, when we take the absolute value of this inner product squared we can just move that squared outside. So now we have a quantity equal to a quantity squared. So there are only two possible solutions to this equation. So either this quantity is equal to 0 or it's equal to 1. So I'll write this out over here. So these are the two possibilities. We have the absolute value of the inner product of psi 1 with psi 2 is equal to, these are the two possibilities, it's equal to 0 if psi 1 is orthogonal, this is the sign for orthogonal, to psi 2. You can see that this uh, symbol for orthogonality is the same as the symbol for something being perpendicular. That's because uh, this in a Euclidean vector space, if you have perpendicular vectors, they are orthogonal. Their inner product is equal to zero. But if we generalize this concept to a complex uh, vector space, which could in principle be infinite dimensional, that's the idea of a Hilbert space, we will also use this notation. So this means orthogonality. So psi 1 and psi 2 are orthogonal in the case that their inner product is equal to zero. So the absolute value of zero is still zero. So 
what is the other possibility? The other possibility is that this value is equal to 1, and that means that psi 1 is equal to psi 2 up to a global phase factor. And I'll put the global phase factor over here. And I'll write uh, some, some real number beta over here. So beta is a real number. And I'll put psi 2 over here. So uh, one important thing that we should probably mention is that this phi 1, we can say phi j, phi j, these are elements of the real numbers. And this is also true for beta. Beta is also a real number. So it's a real number that then gets multiplied by an imaginary unit, and that is used to construct this global phase factor. So these guys are real numbers, and in general, these inner products, they are complex numbers. But if we take the absolute value of that complex number, we're going to get a real value. And there's only two possibilities for what that value can be. That's either 0 or 1. And 0 is the case where they are orthogonal. 1 is the case where they're equal to each other up to a global phase factor. So these are the only two possibilities where this unitary operator can work. These are the only possibilities that allow for the cloning of a quantum state. That means, in general, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for a general psi j. And that's a big problem. We're running into a contradiction. So this is why this is called a proof by contradiction. We have supposed that this relationship holds. We are supposing that a unitary operator exists which satisfies this relationship for cloning a quantum state. But we did some reasoning. We found the bra version of the equation. We applied that bra version of the equation to both the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And we did some deduction, and we found this relationship has to be true, which means there's only two valid possibilities where this can work. So in general, psi1 and psi2, they are general states in this Hilbert space. So they are not going to satisfy uh, these conditions in general. So only for these specific outcomes are we allowed to clone a quantum state. So this is known as the no cloning theorem.